introduce this. Thank you for the introduction and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak. So today I'm going to be telling you about generalized global symmetries and gravity. And this is talk is going to be based on a paper which appeared last month and was written in collaboration with Miriam Svetich, Jonathan Heckman, who's in the audience, and Ethan Torres. Of course, there are works preceding this and I'm building on ideas that have been developed with many other co-authors of which Michele, Yinan and Laksha uh, should be in the audience. So Jonathan did a great job of setting up my talk. And so I'm gonna keep the motivation brief. I don't need to tell you that generalized global symmetries are interesting and powerful. They can be used to analyze the phase structure of QFTs strain R, constrain RG flows. And they've recently also found their way into the FINA community. And they are now beyond the standard model models where they are the key ingredient for engineering uh, finite mass, but exponentially mass suppressed neutrinos. Uh, the, the point is that while the presence of generalized global symmetries are interesting, so can their absence be. And this has been, uh, this is most prominent in, in quantum gravity, which is believed to have no global symmetries. And this absence of uh, global symmetries has been formalized by the cobordism conjecture, and it has very concretely uh, led to, for example, by computing various cobordism groups, as Jonathan showed us, to the prediction of new supergravity defects, which have been found, and to the prediction of more exotic things like end of the world brands and type 2b, which have not been found. The general argument in quantum gravity that global symmetries should be absent normally revolve around black hole dynamics and their incompatibility with global charges. But so in this talk, I don't want to go in any of these directions. I want to consider a purely geometric setup in string theory. So there'll be a compact internal geometry. And I want to argue for you that already this setup, uh, we find that geometry forces on us um, the absence of global symmetries. Okay, so here is the problem in a little more detail. We're going to be considering M theory, type 2A, type 2B, on some compact singular space X. And this is going to build for us some supergravity theory. The minimal example that you can keep in mind throughout this talk is, is the very simple one of a four torus quotient. And such spaces have singularities. There are some vanishing cycles, brains wrapped in vanishing cycles give you some localized degrees of freedom and they organize into a quantum field theory sector. Usually these quantum field theory sectors are studied, uh, can be studied in isolation by taking some uh, local model. So you just consider the geometry in the neighborhood of where these degrees of freedom are localized. And in this process, you decouple gravity, you get a quantum field theory, and um, these have generalized global symmetries. And the simplest case would be just this uh, ADE singularity. So the question we want to address is, well, so what happens to the generalized global symmetries of such a quantum field theory when we couple gravi recouple gravity or when we put the local model back into the global model? And to uh, make progress on this question, I first need to tell you um, how I want to geometrically characterize these symmetries so that I can track them in this process. Down here, I have a small comic of the situation I have in mind. There is some compact geometry. There are some singularities right here. And in this comic, taking the local model means literally truncating the space along the dotted line and looking at these now non-compact cones. OK, so let's begin by characterizing the symmetries uh, in geometry. So roughly the data of the QFT that I want to match are the topological symmetry operators. These are, you can think of them as maybe these flux operators. 
Then the non-dynamical defect operators, these are like the Wilson lines of our theory. And um, then there's of course, they, they, they are like, they function as the representations. And then there, of course, the, the full fusion higher category. I'm going to focus on the first two parts because these are better understood in string theory. The full categorical structure is something that is known. Uh, there are various bits and parts which are known, but the, the full story is not understood, but, it, but it's in development. So the question we're asking is, right, if we have a QFT, which can be engineered this case purely geometrically in string theory, how do these symmetry operators and defect operators lift? And uh, the answer has been known now for some time and we saw uh, basically the slide already in the previous talk. So the answer is that both defect and symmetry operators can be constructed from flux brains. So the picture here, right, I've drawn the internal space and I've drawn space time. The internal space has a singularity, which is at the apex of the cone. That's where the QFT degrees of freedom are localized. Um, the non-compact cone has a boundary that's partial x log. Now, defects are constructed by wrapping non-compact cycles. Those are the red cones because they have infinite volume in the internal space. They're going to be non-dynamical uh, pro-insertions of the QFT. So every direction which doesn't extend internally is going to extend in space time and give a defect D. Now the symmetry operators, they're constructed in much the same manner. We take a brain, but we only wrap it on the cycle gamma purely in the asymptotic boundary. And the reason that this constructs a topological operator is because the because it's localized in the asymptotic boundary, it is infinitely far away from the QFT degrees of freedom, and so can interact with them at best topologically. Now, a symmetry operator constructed like this is going to act on a defect if they link both in space-time and inside of the um, asymptotic boundary. And the brains that are being used in the construction should be electromagnetically dual. And in the examples we're going to consider, it's going to be M2 and M5 brains that we care about. What I want to mention also is that this philosophy applies more broadly. We know that something being geometry is not a duality invariant statement. And as you saw in the previous talks, we can play similar games in, in brain setups. So here is a little more detail um, on what I meant by the picture. So the defect operators, you, you wrap them on these homology quotients. There's a screening argument which motivates that. And then keeping the picture again in mind, of course, we can characterize these defects by their asymptotic cross-section. And so there's this isomorphism into the boundary uh, and uh, into homology group in one degree lower. And then for the symmetry operators, we, we just care about the homology groups um, of the boundary, partial x log. The, there is now a slight distinction to be made depending on whether the preferred geometric pairing and the boundary is intersectional linking. So if we've wrapped our brain on a torsional cycle, then we, yeah, we could, sorry, if we, then we're going to wrap a, a membrane and linking is the preferred pairing. And if it's a free cycle, then we should be wrapping a flux brain and intersection is the preferred operation. Now the non, the, the non-trivial data, the, the topological field theory living on the on, on, on the symmetry operators in many cases uh, is simply inherited down by compactification from the topological degrees of freedom on the brains. And so this is where these non-trivial fusion rules come from. And this is why this approach is, is so powerful because we can import machinery and string theory where anomaly problems have been solved and um, apply this to, to, to the field theory setup. It should also be said that this approach is, of course, only as powerful as, as well as, okay, you need to understand the topological degrees of freedom of the brains that you wrap. And so, for example, if you wrap strongly coupled seven brains, things become a little more complicated, but, but they're also manageable as we, we, we've shown. Okay. So now I've given you a geometric characterization of 
the defect operators and symmetry operators via their supports. And now we want to return back to the global model and we, we want to understand what happens to these, these objects uh, when we glue the local model back into the compact model um, or couple it to gravity. And in words, for defect operators, the following effect is that the the, the cones used to construct the these, these defects, they are going to compactify. And this will contribute extra massive matter. And so that's the effect for the defects. And for the symmetry operators who care about the supports. And now because they are inside of, let's say we're gluing in multiple local models, we will have symmetry operators and their supports for each of them. And they can now, now that now that they're connected through the bulk, they can be compared. And so there'll be some relation homology for their supports, and this will trivialize symmetries. I will show a picture momentarily, but all of this is, is organized by the Maya Via Torres long exact sequence, which, which I've uh, written out here. So to make it precise in this minimal example, right, this compact space has multiple singularities. So I want to talk about multiple local models and then the relevant local model for all of them is simply the disjoint union. Exerc is simply the bulk, everything away from the singularities and is the complement of uh, these, these local models. So that's the uh, top line. And so here I've drawn a comic of how different local models talk inside of a compact geometry. So on the left, we have the symmetry operators. Each of these little cones is a local model, exactly as we saw it a few slides ago. And in the boundary, there is a one cycle, or sorry, jumping ahead, there's a cycle, gamma k. And the different cycles between the local models can now be compared. And there might be relations and homology trivializing a collection of them. And so we're after these bounding chains, gamma i, j, k, which, which give these effects. And on the right-hand side, very similarly, the defects, the uh, non-compact uh, cycles, the, the red cones are, again, by chains, sigma i, j, k, they're going to be compactified uh, into, into a curve. And exactly these gammas and sigmas is, are the, the pieces of data which enter the Maya via Torres sequence. Okay, so this is the, the general picture. So now I want to uh, discuss a class of examples where this uh, T4 mod Z2 fits into. So I want to consider uh, compact singular K3 surfaces and I want to put them in M-theory. So if I do that, then I will engineer a seven-dimensional supergravity theory, S, labeled by the geometry X, and each of these ADE singularities is going to support a seven-dimensional super young mill sector. This is very standard. And here I've drawn just one of these uh, local neighborhoods. So that's a tubular neighborhood of the singularity inside of the compact space. So again, this is just characterized by an ADE singularity. The asymptotic boundary is a three-sphere quotient. There is one or two torsional one cycles at the boundary of that local model, local model component. And the defect and symmetry operators are now built from either M2 or M5 brains wrapped on, so the defects on cones over this gamma i and the symmetry operators on gamma i itself. The local model is a collection of these things and, right, and therefore we have a collection of symmetry operators and defects for each local model. So we, put this into the uh, Maya via Torres sequence and we obtain this four term exact sequence. It's cut out by the simply connectedness of the K3 surface and the fact that uh, S3 mod gamma doesn't have any two cycles. And so now I want to discuss the sequence in a little more detail and what, what we can learn from it. Each group and each uh, error in this sequence has a, has a physical interpretation. So let's start off with this term right here. 
So this is the boundary of the local models. I told you that's where the gamma i's live. So either considering cones or gamma i's themselves, I can associate to these. These are the defect and symmetry operators. Their supports are geometrized here. Then these are just the compact two cycles, which you know they, they stretch through the compact uh, deformance at two, for example, and they maybe touch singularities, but they, they can be wrapped by M2 brands or M5 brands and they contribute um, extra massive matter. Here we have um, extra U1s and this group H2X circ gives you extra U1s because right, U1s are only extra if they do not participate in gauge symmetry enhancement. They're not like the, so the, the, the curves under the solid let's say W bosons. And for this to happen, they need to be away from the singularity. And that's why they, these are these are classes in, in X circ, the complement of the local model. And then over here, these are the uh, emergent and or broken symmetries. Remember that if you look one step before in the sequence, this is where the support of the symmetry operators uh, lives. And so now we've pushed them into the bulk, X circ, and now we're comparing them. So H1 X circ tells me what collection of symmetry operators are, their supports are independent in homology. And so these don't go away. And so these will be, these will be broken by um, meta that I've introduced in the compactification. And down here, I've, I've written out the, uh, uh, the key physical uh, duality, which is derives from a, a, a chain of uh, and okay, let's just do it. So you can you can apply uh, Poincaré left sheds. and then you apply excision. These are just the locations of the ADE singularity. So you shrink down what you've excised. Then you can use the long exact sequence in relative homology. And then you can use the universal coefficient theorem. And this statement is exactly the state, this, this isomorphism is exactly the statement that the symmetry operators, which are like which are left over, are going to be the ones acting on the extra mass of matter that I've introduced, and right. That's why the, I have to check which is the Pontryagin dual. And this is why they are broken. Okay, so this characterizes the the symmetries which will be broken. So there is a subset within H partial X log, which. Uh, it's not broken. These are the ones which are gauge and trivialized. They're in the image of the, the map before. Um, right. This is the bar comparison I was speaking about. And in, in this map, there are some 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 important U1 charge normalizations which which people have cared about in uh, in various settings. Okay. So uh, the in, in this class of examples, the there are there are Right, we've put M theory on a K3 surface. The field theory sector is seven dimensional. And um, I care about one form and four form symmetries. And these are constructed by wrapping M2 and M5 brains on this H1X uh, partial X log. The statement that none of these global symmetries survive when I couple to gravity is now simply the fact that this sequence is exact. Either I'm pushing my symmetries to the right and they'll be broken, or they go to the left, which means that they're going to be gauged or trivialized. And right, this is what I've what I've what I've spelled out here in, in more detail. Okay. So this is the, the general philosophy. And so let's look at some con concrete examples. So a subset of single K3 surfaces are portions of T4. 
as you can take quotients by Z2, 3, 4, and 6. And then the technical difficulty lies in evaluating this, this, uh, these sequences, and um, which there are some shortcuts using equivariant methods, but really finding the maps and um, saying exactly how uh, these trivializations and breaking happen is, is, is the meat. And this is all spelled out in the paper in more detail. And so, for example, the non-trivial things are this, these here in the second entries. So it's maybe not that easy to guess that there is Z2 to the five torsion for two cycles in uh, T4 mod Z2. Um, OK. So one consequence of knowing these sequences is that uh, we can we can derive the uh, supergravity gauge groups, and this is simply because due to the um, the fact that the the center of the supergravity gauge groups needs to be the part which uh, acts uh, effectively on the matter, and so from these sequences we we derive for example that the supergravity gauge groups on these torus quotients take takes takes take these forms. Okay. So now I want to maybe consider a slightly more complicated example and give you a feel for how this, this analysis generalizes. And so we can play the same game with other quotients. So now I'm going to look at T6 mod uh, Z3. So this, this geometry has 27 singularities. They're modeled on C3 mod Z3. And in M theory, each of these singularities uh, engineers an E0 Cyberg 5T SCFT. You can again try to understand the, the symmetries, uh, how they geometrize in the boundary geometry, and how what happens to these supports when you start gluing the geometry back together. And running the Maya via Torres analysis, you extract these two um, sequences here. So how does one argue now that there is there are no global symmetries in 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 in, in this setting here? And there is some maybe it's like a like a sequence hopping that ha that one does. So assume, for example, that we want to we have these okay we have these twenty seven E zero Cyberg SCFTs. Let's say we pick purely electric frame for these, and we have therefore a Z three to the twenty seven one form symmetry. The uh, sequence tells us that we have the defect operators. They're corresponding to the red entry. And then the symmetry operators are in, in higher. In the bottom constructed from M2 brains, in the top from M5 brains. Um, what the geometry then, then tells us and how it enforces no global symmetries is that, first of all, it tells us, well, there are this Z3 to the 17 extra massive matter. This break, now you go to the top right, these uh, the symmetries which remain independent of the bulk, that's H3 X circ. The symmetries which are not broken are the ones which are down here, the three to the four. Uh, these symmetries are then gauged, so they pop out as a dual quantum symmetry. So you go to the top left, the three to the four. And these these are then broken by M5 brains wrapping these torsional cycles. And so over and all, like jumping these sequences, you've accounted for 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 all symmetries in the local models. And here the, the resulting gauge group would be this. Okay. So with this, I'm uh, going to conclude. So in the so things that we also discussed in the paper, but I didn't have time to tell you about were elliptic examples. There a lot has been that where a lot of work has been done with using model vial torsion, and one can one can match onto the, this analysis. Then uh, another interesting thing is that, so what 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 what's what's a way of stating what I've showed you? I've I've said that if I have a set of local models and I compactify them, then just that fact alone forces on me field theory manipulations which trivialize all those symmetries. I'm adding matter breaking and uh, gauging. And all of this field theory part can be captured by uh, an interesting, there's a way of reformulating it using symmetry TFTs. And this is a different way of understanding that no global symmetries remain. And so what I mean by this is, recall, for example, in this example, there are a lot of singularities sprinkled around and you can 
grow the local models. And locally to each of these, you're going to have a symmetry TFT, which extends radially out from it. And what the what the compact geometry tells you is that there is no infinity to set boundary conditions. So what happens is that the symmetry TFTs all run, and there's going to be like a there's a, there's like a tree of TFTs, and they're going to form a single junction. And this is where the extra you ones live, and they uh, give you non-topological boundary conditions. And this is something we, we explain in the paper too. And then I focused here only on simple geometries where there is a higher form symmetry and nothing more complicated. And you can also run a similar analysis for more complicated symmetries like, like two group symmetries. And Jonathan has discussed some of this. Uh, okay, thank you. So basic question. Uh, so yeah. you you had these defects which uh, go into the singularity, right? In these pictures. You think about this one? Yeah. yeah this. Uh, so uh, what happens to them if one tries to resolve the singularity? They 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 hang around basically. So the simplest example is taking a one singularity, resolve it. That's the cotangent space of S two. Uh, so instead of like let's say wrapping a cone which hit the singularity, you're going to be wrapping the fiber class of this cotangent bundle. And it's a similar thing in general, like yeah, yeah, yeah. there's some sort of uh, surface singularity. Exactly. So the yeah, the, just the the, the 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 screening argument that um, with by the compact cycles that now becomes a little more manifest. But there being a non-compact thing is is the key ingredient, which is invariant if you resolve it or not. Thank and you. The questions. Yeah, I can ask a naive one. Okay. Could you comment more on the cases of the elliptic labials twofold and threefold? Say, uh, how the fibrin structure may you know impact on the sequence that you are considering here, because they could be like more singularity appearing just uh, beyond the cases with all be folding. Just very naive. Yeah, so, okay, there you can play a very similar game of cutting apart your space. Mm -hmm. It's slightly different. You're going to cut apart the base and just put the fiber above it. And so let's go to... Yeah. So the, 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 the torsional part of H2 of X, and for, for say, elliptic K3s, is going to be the model vial group. But H2 of X circ, which uh, has the extra U1s, is not quite the, the free part of the of the model vial. There is, uh, so, because as I said, if you if you, you do not, if, okay, the, uh, the cycles relevant for the free parts uh, shouldn't participate in gauge symmetry enhancement. So they need to be away from the singularity. And model vial doesn't quite uh, doesn't quite characterize that. But what and this is something that Shioda already realizes that you can define certain subgroups so that your rational, rational sections uh, all intersect the same affine node. And this gives an interesting subgroup which should be identified which H to X circ in, in certain cases. And then the other ones are are very similar as you as you might expect. Does it work? Yes. Or it does. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. For our next talk, we are happy to have Luigi Tizano from ULB who will tell us about non invertible symmetries along 4D RG flows. Yes, so uh, thank you very much. I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present this work that I've done in collaboration 
with people both at ULB and CISA. So Eremias Aguilar Adamia and Ricardo Argurio, both from ULB, they are all here. Francesco Benini and Christian Copetti, also from CISA, then, that are here as well. And you heard yesterday Francesco saying things will are very related to my talk today. And then Sergio Benvenuti, also from CISA. And the overall uh, theme of this talk is the following. It, it actually relies on a very traditional question in quantum field theory, which is when you identify your, the global symmetry in your theory. It is an interesting question to um, turn on various symmetry preserving operators, and try to understand the dynamics of the theory after we introduce these symmetry preserving operators. And today I want to convince you that also in the case of non-invertible symmetries, this question can be addressed and it turns out to be interesting. So in fact, I wanna give you uh, an example of this uh, type of analysis in two dimensions. And for to do this, I wanna tell you about uh, this example that is the tricriticalizing is a, a famous example of a minimal model with central charge seven over 10. And it has a finite uh, number of primaries being a minimal model that I listed here. And the subscript in all these operator denotes the conformal dimension. Yeah, so this model has non-invertible symmetries uh, that have been studied by many authors. And it was emphasized in this work from 2018 that there are, this model admits two interesting uh, RG flows, which actually preserve these non-invertible symmetries. And in particular today, I would like to focus on the, oper on the flow triggered by this operator of dimension three over five. So this flow has been studied, studied uh, for a long time in the literature since the eighties, in fact. And it is known that depending on the sign of the deformation of this operator three over five, the tricriticalizing can either flow to the uh, Ising model or can flow to a gap phase with the three degenerate vacua. And this gap phase is very interesting for what I want to tell you about today. And in fact, uh, there was this uh, interesting paper uh, on the lattice by Hughes in 84. He was talking precisely about trying to analyze this type of flow. And in fact, he noticed uh, that uh, in the gap phase, there were, uh, he called them phases. I will refer to them as vacua. And he was saying that these three vacuas are not related by any special symmetry. So today, in fact, I want to uh, convince you that we now understand what is the symmetry that acts non-linearly on this vacua. And, uh, and I wanna actually also convince you that this type of example are not limited to two dimension, but they're in fact are interesting example in four dimension. And so today, in fact, I will introduce and tell you about this idea that we would like to actually consider a system where the non-invertible symmetry is spontaneously broken. And interestingly, in these systems, we will see that the ground states that are acted by this non-linearly realized symmetry have very different physical properties. And so in this picture that I'm gonna tell you about today, the three vacua of the mass deformed tricritical are interpreted as a sum of vacua coming from a gauge theory, D2 gauge theory and a trivial phase. But so in order for me to tell you about four dimension, I need to set up the stage with some general aspects of four dimensional gauge theories. So let me remind you very quickly about SUN and PSUN gauge theory in four dimensions. So SUN Yam Mills theory, as we all know, has a one form symmetry ZN that acts on Wilson line operator in a representation R of the SUN gauge group and this N of R denotes the annality of the representation. Associated to this Wilson line, there is a topological operator that I define as U of, of E. And uh, it is very important to remind that uh, in SUN gauge theory, one could also talk about the toothed operator. However, this operator is non-genuine. What I mean by non-genuine is that in SUN gauge theory, the Wilson line can actually detect a direct string that emanates from the uh, toothed operator. And so for gauge invariance purposes, this toothed operator must always be attached to an open version of the one form symmetry uh, topological operator UE. So in this picture, in fact, you can think about UE as the worksheet of the Dirac string in SUN gauge theory. So when you 
R in SUNGH theory, and you understand that there is this one form symmetry, you can in fact turn on a background field for this symmetry. And you can add to the past integral a phase that I denote by SPTK. This k is an integer that labels different SPT phases. And it is very important to uh, remember that whenever this background field is non-zero, the theory in fact has fractional instant on number. And so this is very important when we analyze the theta periodicity of the theory. And in fact, shifting theta leads to different theories that are characterized by different SPT phases. In this context, it is also uh, useful to introduce these two topological operations that are gauging of the ZN one form symmetry, where apart for this normalization factor of H2, we sum over the background field for the one-form symmetry. And of course, we can also uh, stack our path integral as a function of the background field B with one of these SPT phases of level one by acting with the operation tau. Finally, let me just remind you that when we act with sigma on SUN, we land on a theory that is called PSUN. PSUN as again a magnetic one form symmetry. Now we this will be implemented by a magnetic co dimension two topological operator. And now in the SUN gauge theory, the tooth line, tooth line is a genuine line operator, while the Wilson line is not. And again, one can think about the Wilson line in PSUN gauge theory as an open version of the magnetic symmetry operator. And of course, you can also understand the effect of the action of the manipulation sigma if we started on theory with k different from zero, but I'm not going to do it here. Now, of course, this, this analysis can be applied verbatim to n equal four, but there is another crucial point that we have to remember is that in n equal four, there is SL to Z S duality, and this operation independently map theories uh, that have different global forms. In particular, if we, for example, consider SU2, Lie algebra, we will have a network of theories with different global forms that are related by the action of SL2Z. And these are, the, these are, of course, SU2 and PSU2. And as you can see, I'm denoting with the subscript of below PSU2, zero and one, the possibility of uh, uh, having uh, a different, uh, so of starting from SU2 with a different SPT phase. And my theory, the theory that I call PSU21 is a theory with ge unique genuine line operator is a dion, which you could consider as the product of the Wilson and the Tooft line, of the minimal Wilson and Tooft line. Now, an important point is that for any n in n equal four superior meals, there is in fact a combined action of SL to Z and this uh, sigma and tau topological operation. And in particular, if we take uh, SU2, as I said before, one can uh, study the action of sigma and S repeatedly on the partition function of the SU2 theory, which would map us to the partition function at minus one over tau as a and, and B. But at the special point, uh, tau yam mills equal i, equal i, this sigma s operation is in fact a symmetry of the theory. So we can in fact consider the idea of uh, doing these two topological operation on a slab and then considering, since this is a topological operation, considering this as a topological defect that implement a symmetry in the n equal four super yam mills theory. And in fact, it is also known that n equal four in this conformal manifold has other strong coupling singular points. In particular, it has this strong coupling point at uh, E equal two pi over two pi i over three. And in fact, at this point, there are two stabilizer group, both yeah, this i and E two pi i over three, which are Z4 and Z6, which generate what we call the S-duality or the ST triality symmetry. And an important aspect is that this S and ST triality symmetries are implemented by this topological defect was fusion leads to uh, this right hand side where we have another topological operator that is known as the condensation operator, which signals the non-invertibility of this uh, symmetry defect D.
So this is the, the idea that in n equal four, we can find this non-invertible operator for the action of, of S duality or S T triality. And so starting from this, we want to ask the question of deforming n equal four and trying to preserve this symmetry along various RG flow. So let me remind you that in n equal one language, n equal four has a one vector multiplet, which I denote with a mu and lambda and three adjoint uh, chiral multiplets that I denote by capital phi. And it has a cubic superpotential W. So now it is important to remember that, uh, and this is a subtle point that uh, SL to Z also acts on the elementary field and of n equal four, and in particular acts on the supercharges of the theory. With a way, with a, with a, if so, if we denote a matrix M with the, in SL to Z, this is the action. So there is this square root that depends on C and D on the C and D parameter, and so. For a ZK cyclic subgroup of SL to Z, that we, which is one of the cyclic subgroup that we have at a strong coupling point, the supercharge uh, gets a phase. Now, this is very important because in the convention that we are working with, both scale the scalars are neutral and the fermion transforms at the, as like the supercharges, and so if we want to turn on superpotential deformations, which are of course integrated along superspace coordinate, we have to be very careful because if we operate naively, we would immediately break the symmetry. And the class of superpotential deformation that we are particularly interested in are superpotential deformation by the trace of phi squared. These are half, uh, these are BPS deformation that, are, that have been studied uh, for a very long time in the literature. The most general one is uh, the deformation that ha leaves, gives a finite mass to all the chiral multiplets. And it is known to lead to a theory that is n equal one star. I will describe what it is. While in the other two cases, we have either a theory with n equal two supersymmetry, or we can flow to a theory that has a quartic superpotential and has a conformal, flows to a, a CFT with a conformal manifold. And so the question is, how do we render the theory compatible with uh, and, the, and the symmetry compatible with this delta W deformation? So the idea is as follow. As I told you before, the superspace coordinate will be multiplied by a phase that is e to the two pi i over k. And so uh, this superpotential deformation will pick such a phase because all the chiral multiplets are neutral in our convention. However, Super, whenever we turn on this delta W deformation, we also break super conformal invariance. And so this comes to the rescue because we can always pick a suitable uh, rotation that is part of the super broken super conformal symmetry to redefine our defect in such a way that it is a composition of this uh, R phi rotation and the original defect for the self, self S duality or ST triality symmetry. And we declare this as a new non-invertible symmetry of the deformed theory. Let me show you an example. For example, we want to let's say that we want to study the n equal one star deformation. This n equal one star deformation will pick a phase because of the action of the SL to Z group that is two pi over k. But then we can just study the R charge assignments of elementary field in n equal four to understand that the superpotential deformation has also an R charge that is minus two over three. So we can compensate the phase in uh, SL to Z by this, a suitable rotation in the UNR superconformal symmetry. And such uh, a combination defines, in fact, a non-invertible self-duality symmetry of n equal one, super, n equal one star super young meals. So let me just remind you very briefly aspects of these n equal one star super young meals. This is a theory with gauge algebra SUN. It has a finite set of vacuas that are solution to this equation. And here the phi's are traceless matrices that was, and, and the solution to this equation are in fact classified by n-dimensional uh, irreps of SU2. Sorry, a reducible representation of SU2. And for each classical vacuum, there is a corresponding integer partition of n. So uh, quantum mechanically, what we will have is a 
n equal one theory with gauge al with gauge algebra given by this uh, direct sum, and where these s u and d factors are uh, confining the generic gap vacua. These are labeled by the partition of n, and for generic partition that have k non-vanishing terms, you can also have a bunch of Coulomb vacuas. Now, we want to, in order to carry on this analysis uh, in more detail, let's first specialize to the gauge group SU2, and let's fix the modular UV parameter to I. So we wanted to study the flow of the n equal four theory at tau equal I with this n equal one star deformation. Because of the previous analysis, we know that this theory will flow to a theory which has three degenerate gap vacua, which I denote by H, C0, and C1. And I write this H, C0, and C1 set in correspondence with three dions or three different line operator, where the subscript tells you the, electric, the corresponding electric and magnetic charge of this operator. The idea is that, in fact, in each of these vacua, the corresponding dion is condensing. And since we are studying a theory which is SU2, we also know that the unique genuine line operator in this theory is D10, the Wilson line operator. As such, in the Higgs vacuum, the Wilson line operator in this theory will condense. And this means that in the Higgs vacuum, in fact, the theory has a, a, a Z2 spontaneously broken one form symmetry. Therefore, the Higgs vacuum must be described by a, something that is a Z2 gauge theory. Instead, in both confining vacua C0 and C1, the Wilson line, which is the only genuine operator in this theory, has area law. It doesn't condense. And in fact, the one form symmetry is unbroken. This gives you confinement. And these two phases we will see will be distinguished by two different Z2 SPT. Now, let me remind you that the non-invertible symmetry defect, in fact, also acts on line operator. And because, of, because it, is, it contains the operation S, it exchanges the Wilson, the Wilson line and the Tuft line, while it leaves the 1-1 one, one dion invariant. And therefore, in this theory, you can think that the three degenerate vacua form a doublet, which is formed by H and C0 and a singlet under the action of the non-invertible symmetry. In fact, we interpret exactly this phenomenon as the spontaneous breaking of this non-invertible symmetry in the vacua of n equal one star. So we will have two vacua related by the action of sigma, they form the doublet, and then there will be the vacuum where the D11 operator is condensing, where the non-invertible symmetry is preserved. And in fact, the nice thing is that since we also know that the non-invertible symmetry acts completely invertibly on local operator, we can test this idea using a ordinary local operator for a Z2 symmetry. And the correct one to use is in fact the trace of phi squared. And this in fact can be computed exactly in n equal one star thanks to the work of uh, Dory and other authors in the 90s. And this operator depends on uh, uh, the modular UV parameter and on some integer that, spe that specify the type of vacuum that you want to study. And because of the nice properties of this modular function, you can prove that, in fact, the VEV of the operator O in the Higgs vacuum is actually minus the VEV of the operator O in the C0 vacuum, while the C1 vacuum, the, the dionic vacua, is in fact invariant, has no symmetry breaking of, what, of any kind. Now, once we know that this is the way in which the non-invertible symmetry is acting on different vacua, we can also study what is the microscopic theory that lives in this vacua. As I told you, this will be a topological quantum field theories. And as I told you, since in the X vacuum, the one form symmetry is spontaneously broken, we must describe it by a Z2 gauge theory. So again, a Z2 gauge theory has this type of action and is basically a delta function up to some normalization factor. While in the two confining vacua, we expect to find a Z2 SPT phase that is described by the following SPT. And a priori, 
there is no universal way to assign a value of the SPT phase to Avaqua. But in our paper, which is to assign the value k equals zero to the, to the confining uh, C0 vacuum for the following reason. So as I told you, as duality maps the Higgs and the confining vacua, uh, since uh, this D2 pi 4 involves the sigma operation, we also have to remember that sigma will act on the partition function of the Z2 gauge theory in the Higgs phase. Therefore, we have to find, if we decide to assign the SPT0 to C0, this operation has to map us to the trivial SPT phase. And in fact, if you act with sigma on the Z2 gauge theory, you find exactly one, which is the SPT zero. At the same time, if we actually assign an SPT one to the ionic vacuum, this must be an S-duality singlet. And therefore you have to make sure that the partition function of the SPT is in fact invariant under sigma. And that's in fact the case. So we can thus uh, describe completely all the vacua in SU2 n equal one star in terms of the type of condensing line in terms of the microscopic TQFT and in terms of the pattern of spontaneous, uh, spontaneous non-invertible symmetry breaking. And this doesn't stop to the gauge group SU2. This analysis can be repeated for all the uh, global form in SU2. And as a matter of fact, we extended this analysis of the gap vacua for actually gener general N general global form. And also we analyze the structure of the vacua when you want to specialize the modular parameter to the ST triality point. And in fact, a general lesson that you can draw from this analysis is that there is a correspondence between this global variant of n equal four or n equal one star with, gap, with their gap vacuas and with ZN one form symmetry TQFTs. Okay. Uh, so. I just have maybe two minutes. Yeah, two minutes. Uh, let me just try to, okay. There are some subtle anomalies that involve S and ST duality that we could match. Sorry, let me just, I, I just wanna also add another comment. Now, in fact, exactly as in the 2D example, depending on the type of deformation, we could have had a gap phase or a gapless phase rising. It is in fact possible to also find gapless flows. And it is also possible to start from a theory that is not n equal four. For example, a very simple next uh, example is studying Lagrangian n equal two quiver CFTs, which have bifundamental hypers. These are the holographic descriptions of type two B on ADS five times S5 mod Z2. And again, you can study how these theories admit a non-invertible generalized as duality symmetry. And you can study flows that bring you to n equal one theory. In fact, as a matter of fact, this theory will famously lead you to the Klebanov-Witten theory. And we can prove by our arguments that in the Klebanov-Witten theory, there will be such preserved non-invertible self-duality symmetry defect. Okay. So I want to conclude by telling you that uh, in fact, it is possible and quite interesting to study this RG flow that preserve the non-invertible symmetries. We described an example in detail, which involved the spontaneous symmetry breaking of, of D, but there are in fact many examples also where you have gapless flows and an, an exciting application that we are very interested in and we are investigating is in fact also trying to move away from supersymmetry by deforming the n equal four theory with a supersymmetry breaking operator that is the Konishi operator. And then there is also a kind of old fashioned question, but which has not been answered to my eyes, which is in these n equal one theories, you have a bunch of gap vacua. And I think it's a very interesting problem to try in describing the physics of the domain walls in this vacua. We know the physics of domain wall in pure n equal one, but as far as I know, there is no complete description in n equal one star. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention. I, I think it was implicit in, uh, in your discussion that when you add this relevant information, the gauge covering does not run, right? You mean the n equal four? Yes. 
Tau. No, generically, it will have a complicated uh, renormalization. So how does the S2R react on it? I mean, if you're not stuck at tau equal to i, mm -hmm. I mean, how is it possible that the S2R is preserved? Well, I mean, the way in which you interpret it in the, I mean, this is the way, so tau, when you do this deformation, tau will, in general, will be the, some coupling of the unequal one star theory. And yeah, it will have some running, but uh, the way you interpret as duality in the infrared is in this pattern of, um, basically, it is realized non-linearly in the vacua. This is how I interpret mm. it. And we know that it should be there because the deformation is symmetry preserving. Okay. So it does not. I see. Yeah. Ah. Uh... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In the sorry, in the gapless, um, in the gapless, for example, in the gapless flows is a bit easier because there's a part that you don't know, but then you land on a theory that has a conformal manifold, and then you can reanalyze this problem in the conformal manifold. So you see, along the RV flow, yeah, in, the tau is no longer meaningful. Exactly. I see. Thank you. But this is standard uh, also in other, with other symmetry. Thanks for the nice talk. Thank you. Uh, so have you so so if I understand correctly, it works for lots of different. So the analysis should, in principle, work for lots of different RG flows. That's the uh, yeah. So RG is uh, like first you start with the theory with self duality, or uh, and then you. So what yeah. about cases where you allow, say, Lorentz breaking around one direction? So compactify in a circle or something like this. Would the uh, same method work or? I mean, naively, I would just say take the symmetry operators, wrap them on a circle, and then yeah. get something in three D and so on. Yeah. Um, so I think that uh, you can study. Say, let's say you take, uh, for example, okay. If you start from n equal one star, and you already well, and you know that you have this uh, spontaneously broken symmetry with the vacuum and everything, you can ask the question of putting that theory on a circle. And then you can analyze basically what happens to the, there will be probably 3D TQFTs or, and you can analyze that. Well, but well, sorry, if you want to There's two order of limits to consider, right? Yeah, the, yeah. the Kaluza Klein scale and then the mass scale. Okay. So I, I don't know if you get the same answer in the two limits or, anyway, I was just yeah, curious no. if you guys had thought about it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, yeah. But there's no duality in all. Thanks. Other questions? Actually, I have some questions. So yes. about, I was a bit confused about this Z2 gauging. So there was some, uh, uh, this uh, factor which was on the phone doesn't look like the usual factor which you introduce when you do gauging. Uh, you mean the square root of H2? Yes. Explain what, uh, what are the cho choice of this factor? Yeah, okay. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's good. No, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't I don't right now I I don't think I 
So you say it differs by... Yeah. Yes, yeah, so one like I divide by the uh, number of elements of H2 yeah, and multiply right. by the number of elements of H0. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Sorry. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, if not, let's send the speaker again. Thank you. And uh, we will resume in half an hour.